Yeah, sure. What's the smallest game that you've created? You've created anything that none of us know about. The smallest game that I've created? Uh, you know what, when I first... All of great. Funny story. Uh, you know, back in the day when Bethesda was getting bigger, we, uh, you know, we were working on some other other games, and Sea uh, Dogs was a cool game, probably a Keller. And uh, I remember that we, they had acquired the Disney license, so they turned Sea Dogs into like a Pirates of the Caribbean game or something. And I remember working on that, and we were trying to like do it, like try to make the dialogue more. American friendly, you know, less I'm going to slit your throat and, and kill you and a little bit more yo ho ho. And so that was really interesting. Uh, but all the things that, you know, I've been working in the, the AAA video game industry since I started. Um, and I've, I've been very fortunate to do that. So. Yeah. yeah uh, you said that everyone has to participate and the things they created needed to be in the, in the, in the game. Uh, yeah. I'm wondering. Uh, did you create like inside the studio's whole teams, or did everyone have to do it by themselves? And for example, if a writer, when you, if you have a writer, did he have to go into the tools and actually script the whole idea? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a great question. So did we work by ourselves or, or in teams? And, and so it was completely open. You could do something by yourself. Most people would immediately go and, and form small teams with each other. And so they would leverage the strengths. An animator would work with the writer, um, and they'd create these little scenes together. Um, and it just, and actually, so what happened from that, looking at the Game Jam thing, we ended up using that. To this day, we still use that format. Whenever we make content in the game, we use, we call them strike teams or sometimes other names, but it very much feels like everything we put in the game now is like a small Game Jam. That's how we work. Yeah. What is the hardest part of being a game designer? Or the biggest challenge? What is the hardest part of being a game designer or the hardest challenge? I'd say that, boy, that's a really good question. Um, I think it's, you have to be sort of, it's, it's trying to be omniscient, right? You have to like, you have to read the mind of the player, right? You have to know what the player wants. And you have to know what to do and what, what instincts to trust, right? And so because it's, we were working in a creative medium, right? And so Bethesda, I don't, people don't know this, it's a fairly small studio. We're like 105 people, right? It's not a lot of folk, you know? Our animation team, you think with the stuff we do is really small, or, you know? And so it's really hard. So everybody's incredibly creative, and it's very hard to, you know, get a bunch of 100 creative people together who all want their ideas to go in the game and, to, and, and want to, to do their own stuff. So it's very hard to pick the best creative thing or to channels people, channel people's creativity in the right way. Um, so that's one of the, I think that's one of the biggest challenges. Yeah, I'm back there. Yeah. Um, how do you coordinate all these creative geniuses? And uh, I, we have actually, uh, well, the thing about Bethesda, we so Bethesda is a uh, pretty an older video game studio. You know, we've been around. The company is actually not even in Bethesda, the town of Bethesda. It started there. It's in Rockville, Maryland. And um, we've just been making games for so long, and there's very little turnaround. You know, we, we, the people that I work with are the same people I've been working with for like a decade. And so we know each other, you know, it's like we're like a little dysfunctional family, and we sort of, we fight, we have our fights, and we, you know, but we understand each other's quirks, and actually, but we have excellent producers who manage our schedule. So um, when people come to Bethesda, they're very surprised at how quiet it is and how, you know, you think there'll be like nerf battles in the hall, and it's like, it's very quiet. Everybody's got their head down working, and, and everybody is working on a set schedule. So it's just, we have a very good production pipeline. Yeah, all the way in the back. Um, you mentioned uh, that the studio learns from previous experiences when you design the new games in, for example, the Fallout series. In Fallout 4, I was wondering what was the design choice behind removing the karma system from Fallout 3 and other games? Excellent question. Wow, that I, I, it's funny. I was just thinking about that yesterday. So why did we remove the karma system? We we looked at where the game industry was and where games were at, and we and like the karma system is a really interesting way of gamifying morality. You know, like rewarding the player based on good or bad. And when we sort of moved into a system with a voice protagonist and, and a lot more voice acting and and the emotions and, and the morality 
um, were a lot more in your face, it seemed much less necessary to gamify the system. So it, it was more like incumbent upon the player to feel the emotions of like good or evil or right or wrong and, and for that gray area to be what the player wanted. We didn't want to specifically call out, are you being good or are you being bad? We wanted the player to sort of feel it in their head and to sort of, you know, roll with it organically. Yeah? Uh, why did you do the change from tuning to really uh, in front of three? Uh, why did you make that design choice? So why do we go from 2D to 3D with Fallout 3? So when we acquired the license to Fallout, we knew that we, you know, Bethesda made certain type of, we made first person action role play games, and first and third person. We didn't make isometric games, that wasn't our skill set. Um, and those weren't the games we, we really wanted to play or make. So when we got the Fallout license, we knew that we were gonna make it as a first and third person game. Um, and we knew that that wasn't a popular choice with fans of Fallout 1 and 2. Um, but we were, you know, I think since then we have acquired a lot new, a lot more fans who, who like the, the change of direction and that's, it's what we're comfortable doing. I think, you know, when you, you have to work in whatever you're comfortable doing. So, and, and we were, we were really happy with it. We, that's what we plan to do all along. So, yep. Do you consider Fallout 4 to be an action RPG or do you consider it to be a pure action and moving towards that? I definitely consider Fallout 4 to be an action RPG. Um, I think it, I, I think the word RPG is a very interesting word these days. Like no one knows what it means. I, you know, you look at some games that are called RPGs, and you look at like some of their systems and some of the gameplay choices, and you wonder is that really a role playing game? With, if you look at Grand Theft Auto, a GTA is more RPG in some ways than some games that are called RPGs. So um, it's definitely I think the industry is moving away from the standard traditional sort of role playing game thing. Um, but we still have with all the we remove the skills, and so you think if we remove the skills, you're, you're not, um, you know, you're not an RPG. But we moved all that stuff into the perks, so we still have character systems, and we definitely still consider ourselves an RPG. Yeah. Um, seeing as your modding scene is like huge, yep. uh, how does it affect the company? You know, I, mean, I, I know you, you created the Equation Kids and yep. support them on the community, but how does it affect the studios? Do you play these mods, and do you see the ideas and go like, we could use this? And no. We're very careful about not. We're very careful about not looking at mods and saying, "No, let's do that. Let's not do that." You know, we we sort of let the mod community do what they want to do and make the game they want to make. And our games are so big, and and we always, I, I we always get asked this: Why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you do that? And and we just the the, the, the true answer is we run out of time. You know, we can't do everything. That's one of our models. We, we can do anything, but we can't do everything. And so in Fallout 4, it felt like we were trying to do everything. Um, but we know that eventually when the modders get their hands on the tools, the game is going to expand and have a life of its own. Um, we're always impressed by what we see. Some of the stuff is just amazing. Yeah? Uh, it's kind of a little bit creepy question. Uh, Maybe. In Fallout 2, killing kids was an impactful uh, thing on the whole game. Like doing that uh, made your character the like the evils yeah. the guy in the world and the game threw extra uh, bad guys at you. But I was wondering, what, uh, in the transition from two to three, what happened that you like did not allow that to happen again? Was it like your personal preference or is it marketing or just the rules for what can be in the game changed uh, when it comes to you know, censorship or something like that? So I think it's a really good question. Why can't you kill the kids in Fallout 3, right? And video games in general, right? Like, American-made video games, you cannot kill the children, right? Um, I was really happy to have kids in Fallout 3 because the Bethesda games before that didn't have kids. And I think they're important characters and you can tell a lot of stories with them. And originally, we had planned you were going to be able to kill the kids. And uh, we realized, that the, it was a couple of things. We realized that the types of games we make, especially Fallout, was very, you know, graphic violence in the bat system and heads exploding. You you know, killing kids, it was just, there was a level of gratuity there that was just way over the top and just we were sort of uncomfortable with. So but it was also, preference. It, it was partly personal preference. We, we started, we were very comfortable with doing it and then we started looking at it and it started to feel weird to us. And, but also, the ratings board, the ESRB, at that time and, and still to this day, it's like, they're very uncomfortable with killing kids. They're, you know, if they are, you know, and, and so that's the reality of making games. You know, you have to, um, 
yet, yet, that's the climate that we're in. So, yeah. Yeah. It seems like a lot of games are, uh, are moving into a, a more simple design like if you go from the you know, Elder Scrolls Arena up to the Skyrim and all of it today, you see that the systems are much more simple and more, much more streamlined. And the same thing applies to the, the fall. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's, the, what's the discussion about that? Uh, and is that generally a show that's going to continue? So in, in the end, we'll have extremely simple, simple so, so the question is why, you know, there's a, tr a trend towards simplifying games and, and is that going to continue? And I think if you look at, if you look at the games that we make, they are, we do streamline them. They are, and, and you know, a lot of people blame consoles for that, you know what I mean? I, I, I wouldn't blame consoles, but I think there is a, you know, we do develop for console and PC and there's a certain, there is a streamlined sort of approach you take when you develop a console game. Um, it's very different designing a game for with a controller than it is a, a keyboard and mouse. But um, when you look, when I look at Bethesda games, our games are actually kind of kludgy in a charming sort of way. You know, there, there are still we still do things that other games, other RP, other giant RPGs don't. Like we are almost the last bastion of of simulation as far as RPGs RPGs go. I mean, we. You know, a, a big mass market games. The fact that you know we have a crime system and you can screw with the game in different ways. Um, it looks, it looks simple, but there is a level of complexity that's still there. Um, and for us, it's all about accessibility to, to players. You know, and of course, you want to attract more players. And the more accessible the, uh, you are, the more players you attract. So it's always trying to find a balance between. You know, you don't want to make it too simple and too dumb, but you want to attract more players. So. I think it, I think it's the level it's at now is probably where it will stay. I don't see it. if it gets any more simple, uh, I'll be bored silly. Like I don't I don't think that's you know I think it's in a good place. I, I mean actually Fallout 4 is like some of the stuff is really complex. If you you know if you're not a gamer and you pick it up and you like put on power armor and you just lost and try to use the workshop system to build stuff, it's a you know it, it, the thing about now too. I'll continue this for a little bit like. I've noticed that it's actually a little bit easier to, to, some complexity is coming back because now that everyone has access to the internet, no game shit with a manual anymore. Everybody, it's like this weird unspoken rule that everyone knows everyone's going on the internet to find out, you know, information. It's like, you know, uh, if you look at games like Bloodborne and stuff, you, you go online to learn the stories and if you get stuck in something, you go online. So like, I think that leverages a little bit of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, you mentioned earlier that someone at the team has made a version where you accept that when you have 200 years, when you have 2 million years, you get yeah. this kind of universe version. Is there any form of universe that you would want to, so to speak, fall out to find? Like, oh, now we are in an apocalypse space on the Wolfenstein universe, or now the rat pack from Dishonored has taken over the world. Interesting. I never thought about that. I don't, uh, Thank you. I don't know. For, for me, the, the I'm not into post-apocalyptic stuff so much as I'm into the follow universe. So for me, when I think post-apocalyptic, I'm very channeled in the follow universe. Um, I actually don't really like when there's crossover Easter eggs between franchises. Like I, I, I like for our worlds to stand on their own. Um, so I always sort of reject. Like I don't want to find like a Daedric sword in Fallout or stuff like that. Um, it's a good question. Though. Yeah. Yeah, uh, as you being a writer, uh, do you have any uh, stories you've written that are your personal favorites? Like, for my example, it's always been the Dark Brotherhood storylines in the other stories. Uh, the Dark Brotherhood oh, storyline from Oblivion is probably my favorite thing that I've written. Yeah, yeah, that's the. the I think in. I think this. I I think the Dark Brotherhood in Skyrim. I think the story might be a little better, but the gameplay in Oblivion is a little better. And I think because the gameplay is better, it makes the story better. But I think the Dark Brotherhood is my favorite stuff to write there. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, what number one tip would you give to aspiring developers? What number one tip would I give to aspiring developers? Never give up. Never get discouraged. Like things are like, you're gonna make a game that you're gonna make something that sucks. It's gonna happen, right? You're gonna end. But the other part of this is, and this is a you know part of the, the little talk I gave yesterday is like. You know, part one of our studio mottos is great games are played, not made. And it's amazing how many people don't play their own games. You will, you will create content using whatever tool you have, 
and then you won't actually play it, and you don't know if it's good or bad unless you play it. Um, and sometimes you're going to play it, and it's going to suck. And so don't get discouraged. Iterate. Keep working on it. Keep making it better. Never be happy with yourself until it's where you want it to be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you're participating in another game jam right now, is there something you'd like to explore in a smaller format? Smaller game. Is there some? Yeah, boy. <laughs> There's a lot. Let me think about that. Let me let me think about that and cycle back around. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. This probably confidential, uh, but can you tell us something about the uh, web test that next to the future uh, web releases? Uh, no, that is confident. <laughs> I, I, I can't. Uh, uh, beyond what is our, the information that's been released, right now the studio is really focused on DLC for Fallout. Um, and that is all I can say and keep my job. <laughs> and I like my job. So. Yeah, okay. Uh, what, what, uh, what should we keep in mind writers in writing startups games? What things should they think about when writing startups so that they'll make something mumble jumble and weird? Um, so when writing a story line for games, what is the most important thing? And, and I, I never forget that you are like writing for an interactive medium, that the player, it, your narrative isn't as important as the player's narrative. You know, um, you might fall in love with your story, the player might not. Um, and so you have to remember that you know, the, your, whatever story you're writing has to complement the gameplay and not the other way around. Gameplay is always king, right? It has to be. So. I would always keep that in mind when writing for a game. Um, seeing as the uh, Orwin, the storyline is very dark and gloomy and weird in, in many ways. Yeah. And you have a lot of lore in the old schools that's really kind of quirky. Yeah. How, how to translate into you know, the, the new version where it's more medieval and more more centralized uh, for a writer at least? You know, how do you pull out the abstracts and uh, put it into the more mobile like? It's funny, I was just talking about that in the, the talk I did last night. It's like the, uh, you know, when I was doing the Dark Brotherhood, it was actually, when you look at the story of the Dark Brotherhood, um, I, did, I really wasn't crazy about the, the back fiction. It was a little bit messy, so I wanted to sort of like tighten it up. So I, the, the fiction of the Dark Brotherhood in Oblivion is actually the Catholic Church in reverse. Um, the Night Mother is Mary, and uh, Sithis, the Dread Father, is God, you know. Um, and so we, there's so much lore there that's been written by so many people. I think it, it's not all strictly medieval. It's whatever we want it to be. So we really are free to um, sort of change it and you know change some of the older lore to make it what we want. You know, there's still a lot of weird stuff there, but we like it being weird and we don't want to change. So yeah, uh, yeah. In fact, we sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, where would you like to see the the Elder Scrolls series going? Where would I like to see the Elder Scrolls series go? Yeah. Wow, I, I think there, there are so many aspects of the Elder Scrolls of the world, you know, that I think we've seen a lot already. Um, but, you know, there's, um, there's Valenwood where the elves live, there's, you know, um, I, don't, I could go anywhere, really, you know. I almost, you know, I don't know, we, we've tended, I would always, I would love to do, I would love to see Black Marsh, the Argonians, that's one of my favorite regions, so, yeah. I love that song. Yeah. Me? Yep. Um, do you think virtual reality is going to be like a household thing that every gamer has, or is it going to die out in a couple of years? Do so I think virtual reality is going to die out or be a household thing? That's a great question. I like. I. I, I got I don't know. I think we were talking about this. Uh, you know, a few of us went to, to uh, the game developers conference in San Francisco, and you could not walk around. You couldn't go three feet without tripping over someone with a VR headset on. It was everywhere. It was crazy. Like. <laughs> and like, I don't know what you're seeing. It must be great. And like, and I've I've used like the the, the vibe thing, and it, it is transformative. It's amazing, you know. But we were talking about articles that are printed about virtual reality have one of the lowest click rates, you know, like online, because the general public does not seem to be that interested. Like we're all interested. It's like a big thing now, right? And when you use it, it's great. But I think. I think people don't want to wear shit on their face, right? People don't want to walk around with this stuff. Like, I think virtual reality will become something when they sort of break the barriers of hardware. You know, I think it's, I don't think it's going away. I think it's the start now. I don't think it's going to be like 3D movies and then sort of died. I think it's going to keep getting, the technology is going to keep getting better. Um, 
I just don't know how. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you. Me? Yep. Uh, how do you handle criticism on big video like this? You cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you ever take a question? Uh, what? Well, how do you handle? Cri I'll tell you the one. The way you handle criticism. You never engage with the assholes. Never, never. Don't give them any. Like everyone is t is entitled to their opinion, right? Like, and we realized, like, so it, as we started getting bigger, right? Like, we realized there was this weird sort of cumulative effect with everything. You know, if we had a a bug in the studio that we would see one percent of the time, it seems small to us. When the game reached reached the public, when you ship. 30 million copies. Well, 1% of 30 million, a lot of people are going to see it, right? And so, if 1% doesn't don't of people don't like something, 1% 30 million, 1% of 30 million, that's a lot of people, you know? So, there are a lot of detractors. And so everyone has their opinion. Um, you, and you don't engage them. You don't have Twitter meltdowns. You know, you just sort of you take the feedback in. Some of it is valid, some of it's not. And you just have to be an adult stay calm and sort of, you know, try to ask yourself, is this guy right or is he wrong? Is, is she right or is she wrong? What, what are they saying about me? And so you try to pick out the negativity and, and take the valuable information. And yes, you do take a personal <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, whenever you decide to implement some new feature in the game, uh, how do you validate it, whether it should stay or whether it should be taken out again? Oh, that's a great option. So how do we validate new features we put in the game? We play test extensively in the studio. And so we are basically, we are our own critics. You know, we before the games go out, we play it, you know, and any feature in the game that like, everything seems good on paper, and once you start playing it, you know. Um, so we have removed features, we've added features. Um, in Fallout 3, we had, there was a mini game that I designed, I loved it, it was, it, it went pretty far too. It was this, it was a surgery mini game. And it was basically you had to cauterize your wounds closed. And then we started playing it and we realized that it's sort of like a management mini game. It's not really like you have, every time you're wounded, you have to do it. And it, it, it was just conceptually, it was great. But as part of the game, it just really wasn't fun. So we ripped it out and took it out. So we just, that's what you just have to play it and see. Can we do the last question? Uh, one more question? Yeah. Okay, we get time. One more question. All right, who hasn't thrown out a question? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Last one. How did you decide to use a voice protagonist? Oh, why did we decide to use a voice protagonist? Uh, we basically saw that that was the way that the industry was moving, and that was the way we wanted to start telling our stories. Every other major RPG had done it, but like, and I know there's definitely an advantage to the silent protagonist. You know, you can because that can be your voice inside your head, right? But we knew that the there's a certain level of emotion that we wanted to, to relay that you can't do that just by reading. So we knew, and so we auditioned a lot of actors and we knew that we really needed to get two really great actors to do it. And um, we weren't really sold on it until we had actors that we, we liked their voices enough that we said, okay, this will work. So yeah. Good for time? All right, well thank you very much guys and have a great time.